Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so my name is Rod Downey, and I lead the Polar Program for WWF, uh, based here in the UK. And I'm joined by an absolutely amazing panel, um, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but first of all, uh, welcome everyone to our event. It's called Superheroes and Blue Carbon Habitats of the Southern Ocean. And uh, thank you to those of, us, of you who have joined us here in Glasgow. Um, but many thanks also uh, to those of you who are joining online and hopefully from countries around the world. But, you know, no matter where you are in the world, um, it's clear that what's happening here in Glasgow over these two weeks is absolutely critical, both for the future of nature and for the future of hu humanity. Um, our planet is on the brink of irreversible change and irreversible harm. And over the last 50 years, we have um, quite successfully destroyed nature. We've devastated wildlife. Uh, we have really messed up the climate. And uh, we've put the health both of people and nature very much at risk. And we're increasingly starting to realize that uh, the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity or the loss of nature really are two sides of the same coin. So we can't tackle one without f tackling the other at the same time. And this is a really important uh, recognition for us. So for WWF, the fight for our world is, is, is about a lot more than just saving pandas and penguins and, and polar bears. Um, and it really, it, it's no longer an act of charity. It's, uh, it's become an act of survival for humanity. It's, uh, it's also very clear, the science itself, the science is clear. Uh, we can still restore nature um, where it's degraded. We can still limit the mercury from rising beyond 1.5 degrees, but we have to act now and we have to act with uh, absolute urgency and with extreme ambition from now. Uh, and it's clear that the decisions that are made here in Glasgow uh, and indeed post-Glasgow, immediately post-Glasgow, will define our future and our children's future. And, you know, let's be absolutely clear that the next generation will hold us to account. They will not forget if we do not deliver. It's also abundantly clear to us that the oceans and the cryosphere have a really critical role to play, not only in climate science, but also in climate action. But for far too long now, um, the oceans in particular have been very much out of sight, out of mind, and largely absent from international um, policy negotiations on climate change. And we hope to address that. And we think that the tide is, is turning. Um, you know, we are seeing change. Uh, we've seen progress uh, over the last week and hope to be seeing increasing progress over the coming weeks um, on, on integrating the role of oceans um, into global climate policy. So, you know, we have the knowledge, we have the policy tools, and increasingly we have the incentives as well. So really it's time for action, and that time for action has to be now. And. With that, I'm going to uh, hand over and introduce our amazing panel that we have in front of us. So, first of all, uh, to my right, um, we have Professor Dame Jane Francis. So, Jane is the Director at British Antarctic Survey, as well as the Chancellor at the University of Leeds. Uh, Jane's a geologist by training, um, with research interests in understanding past climate change. And in recognition of Jane's services to UK polar science and to diplomacy, uh, Jane has been appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, or just Dame Jane for short. Um, to my left, uh, we have another Jane, uh, Jane Rumble. So Jane is the UK's senior polar diplomat. Uh, she heads up the Polar Regions Department at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And uh, Jane's been in that role since uh, 2007. Um, Jane is a geographer by background, and uh, uh, very fittingly, actually, the Royal Geographical Society uh, recently nominated Jane as a superhero, a geography superhero, uh, on her mission to preserve Antarctica for peace and science. 
Next to Jane, uh, we have Dave, Dr. David Barnes. So Dave is a marine ecologist at the British Antarctic Survey uh, and is also a visiting lecturer at Cambridge University. And I think it's fair to say, Dave, that you've really pioneered, um, the, uh, pioneered and led UK science into uh, both identifying, quantifying, and mapping blue carbon habitats in polar oceans and beyond. So welcome, and then finally, uh, but certainly last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Angus Atkinson. So Angus is a marine ecologist at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and Angus's focus is on plankton and krill, and in particular on developing long-term time series, uh, which offer us clues into how zooplankton responds to climate change over decadal scales. So thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, what, a, what an amazing band of superheroes we've got in front of us. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jane. So Jane, um, can you tell us the big picture about uh, the Southern Ocean and why Antarctica matters? Thank you very much, Rod. Could I have the first slide? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where our superhero krill lives and the impact of climate change. So. Oh. No? When technology allows, <laughs> thank you. We'll turn it on. So what, how is the Southern Ocean, it, how is it important to krill and how is it changing? Oops. So this is a, a NASA image of the ocean, the world oceans. And you can see from here that, you know, you see representatives of the ocean and you'll see in a moment as a straight line, but you can see the complications of the ocean. You can see it's actually, the currents are actually moving here. It's a fantastic image of world ocean based on satellite images and real uh, observational data. The ocean is a really complex place, and this picture just shows that it's formed of lots of small eddies. It's not just one big current, it's formed of lots of small eddies. It's a very complex place. Having said that, I'll now represent it as lines. And the thing about the ocean is that there is just one ocean on this planet, and one ocean that makes our planet habitable. It really would be a dire place without it. And we now know from scientific research that 30% of the carbon and 93% of the man-made heat that we're generating through climate change is taken up into the global ocean. So that's a huge amount of heat that's going into the ocean. And you can see from these diagrams that the Southern Ocean, in particular around Antarctica, is a really key component of that global conveyor. It's where the cold, deep bottom waters, the dense, salty bottom waters of the ocean are generated from Antarctica. And it, at, at the, ocean, the Southern Ocean is massive. It's one of the stormiest, windiest, and uh, believe me, it's one of the most terrible oceans in the world because I'm a very bad sailor and I've been seasick over the Southern Ocean many, many times. But it contains about 30% of the world's ocean water. So here's a different view of it, thanks to Mike Meredith in Bass. So this puts Antarctica and the Southern Ocean right at the center of that ocean. And you can see here, this is where it's a really key component of the global ocean, if you look at it this way. The cold, dense, salty water comes off of Antarctica due to the ice sheets. It flows down into the bottom of the ocean, and then it flows all the way th through the rest of the ocean along the sea floor, where it then comes up in the, right up in the northern hemisphere and gradually warms and circulates back again. So we can't isolate the Southern Ocean particularly. But you can see here in this, this is a newish map of the Southern Ocean, that again, the Southern Ocean, which is the most continuous and largest un uninterrupted flow around Antarctica, is actually full of those small eddies small little sort of uh, currents, and they're really critical for drawing down carbon dioxide and heat. And so the Southern Ocean is so large that it's taking in 75% of the man-made heat. So it's a massive, massive, it's doing us a massive favor. It's taking in the heat 
that we're generating, mostly in the mid-latitudes where all the cities and where people live, and it's being taken down into the Southern Ocean. And it's been estimated that if that heat wasn't going into the Southern Ocean, the temperature of the Earth would be 36 degrees warmer than it is now. Staggering, staggering. Imagine that. I mean, that is a staggering number. And it absorbs, as it says there, 50% of the annual CO2 is being drawn down into the ocean. So it is doing mankind a huge favor right at the South Pole. Now, why is it going down there? The reason why the Southern Ocean is so special is because Antarctica is there. You can see in this diagram that the water is coming from Antarctica, cold and salty and dense and it just comes straight off of the continent and it zooms straight down into the bottom of the ocean. It wouldn't do that anywhere else because it wouldn't be dense enough. And so you can see from this diagram, it is pulling down the heat and the carbon dioxide right down into the bottom of the ocean. And what we really need to now know now is how long it's going to stay down in the bottom of the ocean. And that's one of the things that we still need some scientific research to understand is how long is that heat going to be stored in the ocean? Is it down there for hundreds of years, a few years, thousands of years in, in, a, in those very deep waters? If it comes up again, we've got a massive amount of warmth that's going to suddenly hit our, our Earth, which will have a huge effect. So it's doing us a big favor by taking down that carbon and heat. But in turn, it is affecting our oceans. So I'm sure that you've all heard of ocean acidification and all that carbon dioxide going into the ocean is causing the ocean to acidify. And scientific research again is showing that it has an impact on some of the creatures that, use, uh, that form shells, particularly of aragonite and calcite. And there's been a lot of work on some of these. I've just shown one type here, a pteropod, about a centimeter. I, I use this because they're just, I think they're just amazingly beautiful little things in the ocean. And you can see there on the right-hand side, they have this little uh, coiled shell inside them uh, made of calcite, aragonite. And the acidic ocean is beginning to dissolve some of those shells. Now this. The, 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 um, these uh, uh, sea butterflies, they're part of the food chain. And so once you take out the smallest components of those food chains, in the Southern Ocean, the food chain is quite complex, but it's absolutely essential to the ecosystems around the South Pole, around Antarctica, as we'll hear later from, from uh, David and Angus. And so this is having a major effect on the ecosystems. The pteropods and these very small uh, zooplankton, they feed the hero in the middle, the krill, and in turn the krill and the, uh, the algae feed the rest of this amazing polar ecosystem. Everything from the penguins, we've got elephant seals there, whales, the albatross, the, the other kinds of seals. It's a massively complex ocean and that ecosystem is threatened not only by the temperatures, the warming temperatures around Antarctica, but also by the oceans that are beginning to change. So there's a lot more work to be done scientifically to see how those oceans will change in time, not just from acidification, but what's going to happen as the ocean warms, as the ice melts, is that water going to be fresher? Is it really going to hit the bottom of the, the, the deep ocean? Or will it shallow out because it's less dense? How will circulation change in the future? And, and that's really something we have really got to work hard on. And I'm going to show one last slide because, as you know, we launched the UK ship, the RRS Sir David Attenborough, uh, some while ago, and it was in Greenwich a couple of weeks ago, and it's about to go to Antarctica. And I think the message from me is that for working on our oceans in the future, we need to do massive international collaboration. It's a huge problem. The ocean is massive, and we need to put all our strong brains together, our smartest brains, to do work in this place, to understand what's going to happen in the ocean with climate change, and where the krill fits into that story. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Jane. Thank you. And uh, we're going to continue with uh, Bass Science now. So can I invite uh, Dave? Can you come up and talk to us about blue carbon habitats in the Southern Ocean? Thank you. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Our planet is in climate change and nature loss emergencies. There is linkage here. Nature is very efficient at climate mitigation through carbon sequestration. And that leads to aid us with societal climate adaptation. The low-hanging fruit here is we must make nature to the forefront uh, of our mitigation efforts uh, in a synergistic way. And this is where blue carbon comes in. Blue carbon is the carbon captured by and stored in the bodies of marine organisms. This is a very efficient carbon pathway. It is maximized by uh, intact systems, that is uh, undamaged habitats, those that can be made long term and where water comes into the contact with muds and silts. Think conditions for fossilization, burial of that carbon below oxygen. So I think many of us will be familiar with mangroves and seagrass meadows and salt marshes as incredibly efficient uh, blue carbon systems. But these occur in a very small amount of Earth's surface, and we are losing them fast. Now, for this talk, they don't occur in the polar regions. So, what of polar blue carbon? Well, there are large areas of uh, kelp forests, that's macroalgae, and most importantly, uh, phytoplankton blooms, that's microalgae tiny single-celled organisms that have vast blooms, uh, as we can see uh, on the left-hand side in the greens and the blues north of the island of uh, South Georgia. And the shelf around that, just for spatial context, is about 44,000 square kilometers. We are talking about big areas here. So um, what of blue carbon in uh, polar food webs? Well. Uh, much of that is dispersed through a complex food web, as we've, we've just heard. Uh, some of it is lost by respiration, that is breathing, uh, and some on death by microbial breakdown. But crucially, uh, quite a lot gets into the sediments and is buried. So when we think of polar food webs, we tend to think of large charismatic organisms that we, we've just been introduced around uh, feeding on krill, about which we'll uh, see and hear much more uh, in, in the immediate future. But polar food webs are bigger and more complex than just that, and uh, on the seabed there are a vast uh, variety of species which are only just getting to know. By far the most uh, known polar species occur on the seabed. And remember, this is the site of sequestration. This is where we convert carbon from the bodies of marine organisms to be buried into those muds. So where is polar blue carbon? Well, that's a new project that uh, WWF and BASS will partnership in. And this is where carbon is captured near the surface and mainly coastally and then dispersed into the food web on the continental shelf, which is the light blue that you can see around um, the tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. But it's quite patchy. If we zoom in, we can see the bright red hotspots where, um, where we've been mapping it around South Georgia. And you can see that it's uh, big hotspots on the shelf break, so that's the edge of the continental shelf, not necessarily where it's produced, but where it gets into the sediments, and also in canyon systems and uh, along fjords. So we need to be really smart with our conservation. It's not just about blanket making giant protected areas, it's about getting protection targeted where it's really needed 
and to mitigate threats. So how is blue carbon changing? Well, it's changing in very many ways in response to things like temperature and acidification, and crucially, uh, with marine ice losses. Now, when we lose marine ice, we lose albedo from, uh, so reflectivity from the planet's surface. We lose a crucial habitat for many species, but we also find that we get uh, large amounts of uh, water and uh, that means that there's a lot more light entering the water column and longer and more phytoplankton blooms, which in turn means more food for the animals and more storage of that carbon. So there is some hope that we've got nature fighting back as a mitigating um, effect uh, on climate. And that's really important. So the first way uh, in which that happens is less seasonal sea ice freezing. Um, and, but then we've also got uh, large ice shelves coming out from the continent. So I think we've got a, a huge ice dome covering Antarctica. And where that meets the sea, we get vast frozen rivers of ice entering the water. And some of that carves off to form giant icebergs. Those giant icebergs uh, go out to sea and leave a, a wake of fertilization, uh, and that creates brand new carbon blooms. But also, as we can see in this image, it creates huge new embayments with brand new phytoplankton blooms. You see those, those reds and yellows of uh, new phytoplankton, and that's hoovered up by sea life that colonizes um, the ground underneath. So, these are one of the only places on the planet where we've got um, mitigating feedbacks of new carbon sinks responding to climate change, but only if left undisturbed. The same happens around uh, retreating glaciers, and there are a lot of those, about 90% of the glaciers along the Antarctic Peninsula. This is a particularly fast retreating one, and we can see the retreat rate mapped along it. And there, we can sample, as we have been doing with a NERC project, uh, to look at this new life that appears on the fjord floor. And we're going to have a quick look at that now. So right up close to the marine terminus of that glacier, um, in the top left, is really milky and hostile to life, and there is very little there. But over the years, we start getting the accumulation of the more mobile things, like brittle stars and fish and sea stars that you can see moving in. And then, by a decade or so, we've got really quite a, a, a big establishment of organisms on the sea floor. Well, let's move on in time, and we can see after several decades, we've got really quite an established community. Um, it will be remarkable to most people that in terms of phyla, that is main body types, by a few decades, so this is a very, very young assemblage, we've got more major types of animal groups there in that single fjord than might be in uh, the world's rainforests. So, not, not in terms of species, but in terms of major body types. So an extraordinarily uh, species-rich and carbon-rich environment. So very, very important um, in terms of uh, getting our mitigation because the floor of fjords, of course, has huge amounts of sediment raining down and uh, potentially burying all that. And the carbon figures to go alongside those images uh, have just come out in a, a new paper in Global Change Biology by Zverskaretel. So um, I've been saying, well, it only works if it's left undisturbed. And, and, and look at the fate of blue carbon habitats around the world and how, how few we've got that are undisturbed. Well, we've got an opportunity here. And um, are we, are, do we need to worry about the threats? Well. If we look at the largest single shelf area in the sub-Antarctic, which is the Kerguelen Plateau, 2.2 million square kilometers, an absolutely vast area. And if we look at fishing effort around it, where does it map onto? You guessed it, um, 
pretty much where we think the blue carbon habitats are. We don't know because we haven't mapped them yet. But we should be worried. And it's not just that. If we, if we look at temperature, uh, a recent paper by Ashton et al. showed that a one degree change in warming can actually increase our uh, carbon uptake because uh, of faster metabolism and more meal times and so on. But by two degrees, that effect is lost. And by three degrees, it could be disaster. So we have a very, very narrow temperature window that nature can really help us. So we really do need to get things right. And what about protection? Well, here we can see uh, a map of uh, protection around the Southern Ocean. And that looks great, doesn't it? There's, there's, there's lots of stuff there, except if you look closely, you'll see the light gray is merely proposed. The dark gray is protected, but kind of not really. Um, only the black is no take zones. Uh, Sala et al. this year showed that the ocean lags way behind the land, despite the fact that it's 70% of our planet and by far the most efficient in terms of carbon sequestration systems. And polar lags behind everywhere else on the planet. And that's the place where all the... Um, so we, we really must do a much better job of placing nature at the forefront of our um, mitigation strategies in a synergistic way. It, it really is um, critical to us achieving the goals. It doesn't mean to say that we don't need deep and uh, urgent um, emissions cuts, but we need to make nature a central uh, role in that as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, th thank you very much for that, Dave. So we're going to move on from those amazing benthic habitats now and focus in on one particular species. And, and I have to say, it's a species that still absolutely blows my mind. You know, when you, when you work for WWF, you get asked a lot, what's your favorite animal? And for me, it's, not, it's definitely not polar bears, it's not penguins, it is krill. So um, Angus is going to uh, talk to us in a minute about how krill are both uh, heroes and victims of climate change. But before we do that... Uh, we wanted to share with you what is a world premiere, or almost a world premiere, of our new film. Uh, it's called Superheroes of the Southern Ocean. And uh, this is a film that was produced, by, uh, produced and written by WWF, but with the expert input from British Antarctic Survey and Plymouth Marine Laboratories, and also from Imperial College, and just to acknowledge Emma, who's in the audience as well, who helped with this film. So um, can we move on to the film now? In the cold, deep waters of the Southern Ocean, a team of heroes assembles. Heroes unlike any you've seen before. If you don't know the name yet, now is the time. Krill. Antarctic Krill. No bigger than your little finger, Krill are superheroes of the Southern Ocean. They travel in huge swarms that can be seen from space. Their combined weight is similar to that of all the people on the planet. They could wrap themselves around the Earth a million times. The biggest animal that has ever lived, the Antarctic blue whale, depends on krill. They even glow in the dark. Krill is too small a word. They are guardians of the underwater galaxy. Marvel at their superpowers. Krill feed the undersea world. Without krill, life for many other creatures in the oceans would be very, very different. And that's not all. Krill are climate heroes too. On a planet that's overheating, krill may have the power to help keep us cool. By shedding their exoskeleton every 10 to 14 days, and by eating plankton that absorb carbon dioxide, billions of krill are putting carbon where the sun doesn't shine. Millions of tons of it every year. That's why we all need the mighty krill. Now, more than ever. But even superheroes can be vulnerable. The climate crisis is krill's most fiendish enemy. It's turning these heroes into victims. Krill need cold water. Unfortunately, the way we have changed the Earth's climate means the oceans are heating and the ice 
which protects krill nurseries, is melting. And when krill are in danger, so is the web of life they support and the whole climate of our planet. But it's a danger we can all help to fight. Even superheroes need assistance sometimes. Fighting the climate change crisis, working with nature, not against it, can help these superheroes of the Southern Ocean. There's so much we could learn from nature. Little things can make a huge difference. There's power in numbers. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. Remember the name, the Mighty Krill. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that. I said it was almost the world premiere. I actually uh, showed it at my son's primary school a couple of weeks ago, but pretty much the world premiere. So I'm going to hand over now to Angus to talk to us in more detail about Krill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, continuing this theme of Krill. Um, that was a very good introduction, but I'm just going to put a little bit of more flesh on that story. Continue. Can, is this microphone working now? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to put a little bit more flesh on that story, um, talking about um, Krill in terms of heroes and victims of climate change, just with a little bit more detail. So, uh, with the good news first, um, they support an um, iconic food web, um, which is um, just illustrated some of the key species here. Um, okay, um, they support an iconic um, food web that I've just illustrated some of the key species here, um, but also they support an expanding fishery. They're catching about 300,000 tonnes of krill a year, and that fishery is expanding also importantly it's in actually quite localised areas, posing questions for conservation. And as the film picked up on, they're also important biogeochemically. Um, so this is a, a, a nice, simple illustration of the, um, what's known as the biological carbon pump. So krill are a large zooplankton species, and they're very efficiently um, munching away on the phytoplankton blooms that Dave Barnes mentioned. And the point about the krill, their fecal pellets are large, like the krill are, and they're sinking very rapidly, and that's forming a very efficient export of carbon from the surface layers. Um, but something the film didn't mention was that they're having another role on primary production. They're actually gardening their environment. So by that I mean just like farmers are putting fertilizer on their fields, are actually excreting these nutrients, importantly iron, also ammonia, these important micronutrients, so they're exporting carbon, recycling the important nutrients which are um, supplying primary production. So this is a positive um, feedback loop. So um, this is probably the first example, this plot, of good evidence for krill having this feedback to their environment. So in sites across the southwest Atlantic sector of the Southern Ocean, where there was a lot of krill, they're excreting these nutrients and enhancing the supply of um, nutrients back in to support yet more carbon fixation. So turning to the um, the sort of bad news, the fact that the victims of climate change, all these benefits are under threat um, because um, there's a sort of sad coincidence that the most of the krill are actually inhabiting the southwest Atlantic sector, and this is the sector that's warming most rapidly. So I've just shown on the right hand plot there the warming at um, South Georgia near the northern limit of their range, and you can see it's not actually even. Um, throughout the last century. There's a rapid increase in temperatures up until the sort of 60s and 70s, um, and then it, there's actually a hiatus in the warming since then, and then it's very recently picked up again. That's important um, in relation to the range shift, which I'm going to um, describe in a second. Um, so um, 
as Rob mentioned, um, I love time series, and with help of WWF, we put this um, data set together. Um, it's known as Crewbase. It's an open access database. Um, we made it, um, and it's particularly um, data rich from the 70s um, through um, to 2016. And this has showed quite a profound decline in Quill in their main population center in the Southwest Atlantic sector. So um, if you look at it, the y-axis, it's on a log scale. So this is actually a tenfold decline in krill over a 40-year period. So um, a profound decline that's having an effect on their predators. This is um, South Georgia. Um, and the fur seal um, starving um, in the most recent krill shortage. So the other thing that you notice about this plot is um, I put a straight line through it. It could actually be a series of step changes, and um, it begs the question: Are these conditions that we're seeing last year at South Georgia with the starving fur seals are they going to be the new normal? Um, so to understand what's going to happen um, in the future, um, to, to just to get a better projection on the future, we need to understand the past. And that's why these time series are so useful. So the mechanism behind this decline of krill seems to be not just temperature, but actually a climate mode um, known as a southern annular mode. And um, this is uh, basically the position of the low pressure systems in Antarctica. And with a positive sound anomaly, um, you get um, warm, cloudy, stormy weather um, in the spawning grounds of krill, and that is declining, um, depressing the recruitment and the early life cycle of krill, probably through some sort of a food of effect. So basically, there's a negative relationship between the sand and the krill abundance. And you see it's bad news for krill because this SAM anomaly has become increasingly unfavorable to krill and it's likely to become increasingly unfavorable um, in the next couple of decades at least. So um, the next um, aspect of this um, krill decline is that it's not actually a simple decline across the whole habitat. It's associated with a range shift and basically a range contraction towards the southwest um, or towards the Antarctic Peninsula. So this shows it schematically. Last century we had a krill distribution right across the Scotia Sea. This is looking a schematic looking along the Antarctic Peninsula towards South Georgia in the background. The krill have declined across the northern area, contracted towards a very different habitat area um, in the um, shelves at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's a schematic. This is illustrating that with data. Um, so you can see this heat map of krill distribution um, in the um, last 40 years. The left-hand plot um, is the krill distribution before it um, contracted towards Antarctica, and there's been a very rapid contraction, and it was actually um, probably in a 20-year span over the turn of the century, um, and they have declined um, about tenfold in the north, and there's been actually a slight increase in the south, and that's really important because the area by the tip of this arrow is where a new spawning habitat suddenly opened up around the turn of the century. So that's a really prime candidate for um, marine protection in um, years to come because it's a very localized area of spawning which is actually now supporting probably the whole of the Southwest Atlantic stock. So that's just a, a just it looks sort of a little bit abstract seeing heat maps, but I just wanted to put it into a sort of human perspective. Um, the area of that left-hand map has a population of krill with the same biomass as that of the whole human population of USA and China combined. Absolutely incredible. In the space of only about two decades, that biomass has halved. So if you can imagine the whole of that population um, biomass 
um, land carving is also associated with a poleward's movement of about a thousand kilometers. So that's roughly the distance from Paris up to Glasgow. Um, so if that happened on land, we'd be certainly taking notice. It's got huge implications for this whole food web. So just to sum up, um, models are um, poor at projecting tipping points. That's a very known problem. So So it's very difficult to um, get a, um, a good idea of what's going to happen in future. So management definitely has to be precautionary. Um, we might be in for more surprises. Um, the good news is, I want to end on a, a, a positive note, um, the information flow from scientists into fisheries is improving enormously. There's a working group um, um, who have recently vastly improved that information flow and um, that is becoming a better help for management um, to get um, marine protection. So that's a, a good link to the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus, and you know, some really sobering thoughts there. So um, can I bring you in now, please, Jane? Um, so perhaps most importantly, what are we doing with all this astonishing science? So how can we use it, and what are the policy implications, in particular from a UK government perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, and thank you very much to my science uh, colleague. So it is super important that we are talking about Africa at COP. It may be a long way away, but we've just heard that Antarctica drives our oceans and our atmospheres. Uh, and we know that the planet is warming faster at the higher latitudes. So if COP doesn't keep 1.5 alive, Antarctica is coming to a living room near you. So the future of Antarctica is a global issue. Uh, and for that, it needs global cooperation, especially on science. As Dame Jane said, the science questions are bigger than one nation. We must work together. And understanding and addressing Antarctica's future very much requires the talents of everyone. So firstly, the polar community it, hard to make sure that it's open and inclusive. And I know that some of you in the audience are early career scientists and some of you watching will be early career scientists. So I'm giving you a shout out uh, and an encouragement to get involved in polo as we need the talents of everyone to address these mammoth issues. So Antarctica is the only region on the world that has an organized treaty that protects its future. So the Antarctic Treaty was agreed by many nations uh, in order to set Antarctica aside for peace and science. And this year, it celebrated its 60th birthday. So it's doing all right. Uh, Antarctica remains the only continent on the planet that hasn't seen conflict. Uh, this year is also the 30th anniversary of its protocol on environmental protection, and that's the instrument that prevents commercial mineral extraction uh, from Antarctica. Uh, and we've also just had the 40th meeting of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, CAMELA, which is the bit that looks after the Southern Ocean. So it's been a big anniversary year for the treaty, uh, but there's much work to be done. So the treaty has always kind of prided itself on being uh, a science-making ma decision organization. So making decisions basically on the basis of scientific evidence. So kind of, well, how's it doing? I'm going to focus particularly on krill because that's the subject of today's talk. Uh, and I would say that it's got uh, strengths and challenges in that, uh, in that context. So CAMELA, so that's the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, uh, has as its objective conservation. It was negotiated 40 years ago when there was quite a lot of krill fishing going on. Uh, now that didn't really continue at that time for geopolitical and market reasons, but more recently we are seeing increasing amounts of krill fished out of the Southern Ocean. So Camelar allows kr krill fishing on the basis that it can be precautionary. And it doesn't just look at, is it precautionary for the krill stock itself? It also looks at what's feeding on the krill. So it takes an ecosystem approach. So it's also looking at what the other animals are eating and so on. But it set itself a very precautionary limit on how much, you can, how much krill you can catch. So scientifically, as we've heard, the abundance of krill is the same weight as everyone on the planet. So arguably, you can catch a lot of krill. However, 
if you catch it all from a very small area, then you could be taking it out of the mouths of penguins and seals and whales. So Camelot has agreed a distribution to the catch of krill, uh, and it's just agreed to roll that over for another year while it tries to get a more scientific uh, um, granular scale. As, as Angus has said, there's a working group to get that down to a, a, a better scale. So one of the tools that we have in the, in the Camelot box uh, is marine protection. And that kind of stops some fishing in a, in a vast area. So from a UK perspective, we are very keen on marine protected areas. We are convinced that they do work. Uh, we have for our overseas territories uh, rolled out a blue belt. We have protected 4.3 million square kilometers of UK waters. That's about 68% of the overarching UK marine real estate. Uh, and in Antarctica, we were the first country to propose marine protection, uh, and there was an agreement for the, Southern, the South Orkney MPA, which was on the map that you just saw. Subsequent to that, there was an agreement for the Ross Sea. But crucial to the Krill is an agreement for marine protection around the Antarctic Peninsula uh, and into the Weddell Sea. And the UK is very keen on that, uh, and we have a model in, in South Georgia where we don't, allow, uh, we don't allow any fishing, actually, within 30 uh, kilometers of the coast and we'd like to see that rolled out in Antarctica to protect those areas where you would have fishing potentially coming up against uh, um, animals so penguin colonies etc uh, so yeah marine protected areas are incredibly important um, and any of you that watch Camelot closely will know that that debate is uh, protracted uh, there are 26 members of Camelot that's 25 state parties and the European Union 20 of those have publicly committed to marine protected areas. So we're kind of slowly, slowly getting to a point where we need to get to, which is consensus on marine protected areas. Uh, there was some uh, helpful progress this year uh, in that the G20 also looked for progress. Uh, and the G20 includes Cam uh, China and Russia, who are two of those who are yet to be convinced. Uh, but I just came back from Camelot a week ago, and we are still talking. Um, so I don't have the magic bullet on how we're going to sort out marine protection around Antarctica, but it is pretty clear that we need to keep talking about it. Uh, there are clear anxiety about size and distribution, and so, as the scientists have said, targeting the areas that really need protection is arguably more important than simply size. So that's where we will be focusing our effort. Um, so, and as we've heard though, this is not just a kind of niche Antarctic issue. Uh, when you talk about krill, when you talk about marine protection around Antarctica, you know, it's con we're conscious that it, it does sound like it's a very long way away. Uh, and it's not also just about penguins. It also critically, as we've heard, is also about the carbon cycle of the Southern Ocean. And so, although Camelot was, was negotiated 40 years ago before anybody really thought about any of this, so it hasn't really worked out how to address climate change, nevertheless, if we can get marine protection, which, pro which protects the life cycle of the krill, then we will also have the byproduct benefit of protecting the blue carbon of the Southern Ocean. So it's become even more important. Uh, and if Camelot doesn't effectively manage krill, the whole world is gonna pay a further global warming price. So Camelot needs COP, because COP's gonna protect Antarctica. COP also needs Camelot. So basically, the science is very clear. You've just heard it. Uh, the multilateral system now needs to come together. Uh, and there's an urgency that uh, we've never seen before. But I am pleased to say that the UK is committed to this agenda, uh, and I'm kind of proud to be part of the effort that hopefully will strive us towards greater protection of Antarctica and its Southern Ocean. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much, Shane. And, uh, and I think we all wish that we could find that silver bullet because we have been talking about marine protected areas in Antarctica for a very, very long time. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to open up um, the discussion uh, to questions from the floor. But before I do that, I'm going to use the privilege of holding the microphone to ask the first question. Um, so so my, my first question to my panel, and perhaps, Jane, you could start with this, is um, if we had a delegation of krill coming here to Glasgow, uh, what ambitious uh, asks would they have for the world leaders around the table? Well, I think like any animal actually on Earth, it would be asking to do as much as possible to decrease carbon dioxide levels because that is what's causing the warming and which is causing a lot of uh, turmoil in the world. 
So I would say as simple as that, stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere and do it now because uh, there is a pressing need. Anyone else like to come in on that one? Maybe stop eating my children. <laughs> I think that was the fisheries. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'd be very keen for the, the 30 by 30 that we've, we've heard a bit about, the 30% of the ocean protected by 2030, is not just any 30 or a convenient 30, but actually a meaningful 30. And that means that we, re we really do need to look uh, carefully at uh, what we're actually mitigating against and, and where we put these, these areas. It, it really does matter. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the climate change that is killing off the krill. The fishery is secondary, which we've also got to manage, but it, the primary thing, as both Janes have said, is the climate. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to open up to the floor now, and we've got uh, Martin at the back. Uh, yes, please, Martin. Yeah, thank you, Martin Zumokorn. I'm the, I had the pleasure to, together with Mike Meredith, who you mentioned, lead the Polar Regions chapter in the IPCC ESROC report. Um, I have a question, and it links to your question, Rod, actually. So um, here at the UNFCCC and at the COP, we are working very hard to secure uh, a recurring dialogue, a recurring dialogue on the ocean. Um, and we do that mostly to actually have more certainty of how countries, how the UNFCCC and how across UN bodies, we can actually bring the ocean better into the climate debate. And, and as one key part of that, uh, there's a, hopefully to be inst installed a frame to look into what that means for carbon and how we can actually better account for that carbon, better recognize that carbon. And I'm coming back to the biological carbon pump of the, of the, of the ocean, also recognizing your project that was mentioned here, the WWF project. Um, do we have a good number for the biological carbon pump in the Southern Ocean? How do we get to it? And if anything, can we potentially include what kind of carbon sequestration we would forgo or we forgo over fisheries. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. That's definitely one for Dave. So in terms of an overall number, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that, no, we don't. Um, we have numbers for various parts. So there are areas we, we understand a lot better than others. Uh, part of the problem is a confusion over terminology um, and, and process that um, we talk about carbon capture and carbon storage and carbon export and carbon sequestration. Now, really, it's that long-term pathway to taking carbon out of the carbon cycle that is the key part for climate. Um, and, and so that, I, I think, is what we need to focus on but obviously, you can't have that without the rest of the pathway. The pathway is more efficient in some places than others. It's produced in, uh, it's captured in close to the coast. It's often stored um, in the vast Pelagios that Angus has been talking about and uh, a species rich seafloor. So it's stored somewhere else. And then it is further sequestered somewhere else again on, on, on the shelf breaks. And so trying to put a number on that is really quite difficult. I mean, if, if we take an example of kelp forests, then the, the key sites of sequestration can be hundreds or possibly even thousands of kilometers away from their sources. So I think we're, we're not close yet to being able to put a, a big number on that. What we can do is scale up from the areas we do know. And so, for example, we can say a 5,000 uh, square kilometer iceberg might be worth a million tons of um, carbon dioxide equivalent um, taken out of the system per year. So that's really quite impressive um, and shows that the power that, that all this can have. But in terms of feeding um, up to the bigger models, no, we're just not there yet. 
Thank, thanks, Dave. Uh, we had a question from the lady in the third row. Um. Thank you very much, um, Anna Kedosh, PML. Um, thanks, David. That was a great talk. I, I, if I may address, it follows on from the previous topic. So um, you, you talked about how um, climate change, and Angus also talked about how climate change is affecting krill, and you just talked about the difficulty of, of representing these processes on the seabed in the larger scaled models. And you also talked about the issues with conservation in the Southern Ocean and how we have lots of areas, but not all of them are effectively protected. How, how, what work are you doing or what work are you aware of about how we may, able, may be able to choose climate resilient sites that produce this carbon sequestration in the long run and how, how, we, how effective are these initiatives at the moment if you think that there are any? Is this something that we should be talking about? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, just following on from Dave's response, there's often a, a spatial and temporal decoupling from where carbon is drawn down to where it's sequestered. And the thing I think we should be very interested in studying much better is how this is going to change under climate change. I, I've explained how krill distribution is changing quite radically under climate change. but. You've got to think not just of what krill are doing, but um, if krill are replaced by another organism, how will the efficiency of carbon sequestration change? I think that's the really key thing, because it's, it's not um, a simple sort of linear process. Uh, so um, part two of that question, um, thinking, thinking of the seabed, is that um, that is part of the role of the new WWF um, Bass Partnership Project. Um, and there are other initiatives that um, Emma has in her head um, to expand that wider. So yes, we, we are at the moment trying to look at where are the hotspots of that pathway um, and where do um, threat hotspots map on to those um, carbon sequestration hotspots? And so it's a complex map because, as Angus just uh, suggested, um, we need to know not just the snapshot for now, but what's likely to happen in five years' time and ten years' time. And it, the pattern is changing qu quite rapidly. So we are doing very well in some areas. I think South Georgia being one of them, but both in terms of um, understanding some of the system and in terms of protecting it, but really quite poorly in other areas. So we have a lot of work to do, but I, but I think we're making a good start. And, and in terms of international um, collaboration, there is a, a very big uh, program called Coast Carb, which I think there's um, people from at least Oh, 15, 16 different countries involved, mainly between Europe and South America, that are really trying to piece this together as well. So there is a lot of progress, but a lot to go. Thanks both. Um, Jesse from ASOC, please. Hello, I'm Jesse O'Reilly from Indiana University and Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. I think my question veers a little more into the policy side, which is what can CAMELAR or the Antarctic Treaty System more broadly do? I know the MPA process is w the pace we used to call glacial. Um, it's happening very slowly. What sort of rapid protection tools might be at hand, particularly as sort of focused geographical zones like these uh, fjords or, or areas of ice loss, rapid ice loss, that might be sort of critical to protect maybe temporarily? So that's question a. And second question is, does CAMELAR interact with UNFCCC? Um, and if so, how do they? And if not, why don't they? Thank you. OK, well, briefly on the first question, uh, CAMELAR does establish um, a fairly rigorous regime across the Southern Ocean. So I wouldn't want to leave you with, if we don't have MPAs, there is not protection. Uh, there are actually you know, remarkably few vessels that operate in the Southern Ocean. If you compare it to how many vessels there are off the coast of the UK, it's a, a kind of drop in the ocean. But as I mentioned, if they fish in the wrong places, then we have a problem. So 
it's not just the way that Camelot works, though. We do a lot of work engaging with the fishing industry itself, as they understand for a long-term sustainable investment, they need to have, to have sustainable fisheries. So actually, at the moment, the uh, Association of Responsible Krill Operators are voluntarily keeping their krill fishing away from the coastline around the Antarctic Peninsula. So there are measures in place for some level of protection pending marine protection. And in fact, one of the counter arguments that we hear about, you know, we don't need MPAs because there isn't really a threat. So it's a, it's a little bit chicken and egg in that, but there is, there is space for that. Um, and sorry, your second question was around? UNFCCC, UNFCCC that's right. Uh, yes, so we, um, there is some, some kind of uh, interaction. So the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, which is the bit of the treaty that talks about everything except fish, uh, this year agreed a new resolution that uh, the UK proposed actually about climate change because it's uppermost in our mind uh, to ensure that uh, we were ensuring uh, all Antarctic Treaty Party delegates to the COP understood the importance of sorting out the climate because of the impacts it would have on Antarctica. Uh, we did try very hard to get a similar agreement within Camelot uh, that did not uh, get up this year. Um, we had some extensive discussions and there were some countries that think that climate change might be a good thing for Antarctica uh, in the same way that there's an abundance of fish in the Arctic right now. Um, that is probably, well, there's no real evidence to say that would happen in Antarctica and it's probably a short-term phenomenon in the Antarctic, uh, sorry, in the Arctic. Uh, but yes, we are, are pushing for a greater dialogue between the two bodies. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane. I, I think we're out of time now, so sorry, I'm going I'm to call the questions to a halt. But um, just as a concluding remark, if I may, so clearly the climate crisis is much bigger than any one region of the world or any one species that we've looked at. But we've got this incredible opportunity here in Glasgow over these two weeks to, to really kind of push on ambition and uh, it really kind of focus on that 1.5 degrees that we're all desperately after. So um, I just want to... Um, say a huge thank you to our panel of expert speakers. I think they've been absolutely amazing. It's been a real privilege to have you up on stage today. And thank you, everyone, for coming along to the event. Thank you.